the thing you used to dread more than anything else was to take these out of the box in which you carefully stack them up and then accidentally drop them on the floor. There is no quicker way to discover what n factorial means when you start trying to put them back together in the right order, armed only with your knowledge of Algol programs and which order these things must have occurred in. We have here in the department a legacy deck of punch cards dating, at my best guess, from about 1971. It was left behind by a statistics student of that era, Ken Atkin. It just is like a blast from the past. We'll put this on the classic black background provided by the cover of an iPad. What could be better? Old meets new. At the top of the deck, we used to have to put a coloured card basically stating who we were and what this job was about. Now, I think the first thing to draw your attention to on any sample of these cards is you look at them against the light and if you remember that a card reader is reading vertically to get its characters. Bloom, bloom like that, not horizontally. The most amazing thing you then discover, which threw me for a while because I'd rather forgotten it works like this, is that if you now put the card down on a black background and we'll use another card as a ruler, just look what happens. Every single character, and if you look very carefully, as well as the whole pattern that denotes a character, it can also be printed out at the top of the card, although the printing ribbon was pretty faded about these. Never mind, every single character has got a different hole punch pattern, but there's never more than two holes that are punched. Now that might seem very strange, and as I say, it gave me a jolt. I thought, how on earth does that get converted into a character code which is going to be a bit pattern representing an ASCII character or whatever. You can't just put ASCII character punchings down here. If you did, you'd get into all sorts of problems because some ASCII characters have got lots of one bits in them. And if the situation is that you chose that every one bit was a hole, some characters would make this thing look like confetti. It would be like having a, a, a tear-off form, you know? There'd be so many holes that the actual mechanical substrate of the card will be very fragile. So this is the reason that there are various choices of two holes here out of 11 rows in total. And that gives enough combinations to give a unique code for a fairly limited alphabet admittedly, but it works. So perhaps another thing to point out is that these are cards for an ICL 1900 computer, which was mentioned in the previous video. The ICL 1900 series internally did not hold its characters in 8 bits as would be done nowadays. It held them in 6 bits. So pretty well all of you out there are familiar with the fact that nowadays, if you like, <coughs> the standard for years has been that you have a computer whose integers are held in 32 bits, but if you want, those 32-bit entities called words are broken up into four 8-bit bytes. Nowadays, it's the bytes that are addressed, not the words. And that particular architecture of byte address machines being optionally groupable into longer units to hold either instructions or integers or whatever, that really did start with IBM mainframes. They were the first to go in for byte addressing and 8-bit bytes. ICL, on the other hand, did not have 32-bit words with four 8-bit characters. It had 24-bit words with four 6-bit characters. Why, I hear you cry. The answer is, it's cheaper. You've got rather less memory to provide, rather simpler adders to do. You only need 6-bit adder circuitry, not 8-bit adder circuitry. And uh, it's as simple as that. ICL could make their computers a little bit cheaper than IBM, although they were arguably, as well, a little bit slower and so on. So this is what these hole punchings are all about. They are equating 
by specialised circuitry in the card reader to it being able to recognise these patterns and to say, oh, that's the six-bit character such and such, and it will put that into a temporary file behind the scenes. Now, when you're preparing these card decks, you really did have to take huge care. First of all, the yellow card announces that this is a job for the computer to do. Big surprise there. There's NUPMS there, Nottingham University Physics and Maths, I think that stands for. This is Ken's identifier, PMSKA for Ken Atkin. And I think this thing at the end announces the global terminator for this deck of cards, which will come right at the bottom, four up arrows. OK. Then there's a little piece of job control here basically saying I want the Nottingham University Executive Programme, which was our own sort of homebrew addition to ICL's George operating system. And you notice at the end here, it says by C. In this added module to the operating system, you could say how desperately urgent this job was or not. You were given a certain number of notional pounds to spend every month for every user. And you could opt to spend less money and have it run at low priority. But you could either spend it by A, which means I want the job doing right now, or you could say I'll go overnight and you were charged at a much lower rate. And the next card we see here announces that this is an Algol job. The following cards will be in the Algol language. So this is a signal to the operating system that, to read all this in, but when it's been read in, it has to be fed in to the Algol compiler. And the operating system knows where that's kept, you don't. Unlike Unix, Linux, whatever these days, you don't get very close to the operating system. It's there. Um, it doesn't do much for you except run your jobs. You just had to trust to it, more or less. Notice here, for those of you at all familiar with things like Algol and Pascal, it's beginning to look fairly sensible. Begin. That's a reserved word in the Algol language. It's a bit like open curly brace in C, but Algol use begin and end instead of open curly and close curly. Notice that it's signaled as being a reserved special word because it uses prime or single quote symbols. It's quote, begin, quote. Quote, proceed your quote. That's another reserved word in the Algol language. And it's defining this procedure E01 AAA with these formal parameters or arguments. There we are then, you're sitting in front of a card punch, you type in just like you would do on an ordinary keyboard these days, except this thing is electromechanical, so it's going splash, 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 splash all the time. Every character you hit is punching out holes electromechanically and at the same time is hammering out a typewriter record on the top of exactly what all these holes mean. Every time you hit the return key, whereas even on a dumb terminal you find the cursor going zonk back from, um, from the right hand side of the screen to the left as you look at it, what would happen when you hit return on one of these is that the card would as if by magic be taken away from the punching station and propelled, I think, with sort of compressed air to a catcher tray. So one after another, you would build up a stack of cards in order that would later be fed into the machine. So when it's all completed, and of course the advantage is with having these things written out on top, if you could see any mistakes on a quick scan through, you can always punch another card and replace the bad card with a good card. You would end up with a job to be submitted. Ken's stack is a particularly short one. It just seemed to be running this routine and using it to generate a small amount of data to be printed out. So there we are, a very, uh, very small job. In order to stay sane, what you needed to do was the following. First of all, decide whether your card punch liked to have these beveled corners at the top left or the top right I faintly recall that ICL and IBM probably did them different ways around, but that was the thing to help you get your cards aligned and to stop you turning one accidentally upside down and thereby reading in the wrong hole pattern, in the wrong order, you used to make sure the bevels were in place like that. So that's one self-protection mechanism. 
Another one that was optionally available on some better quality card punches was to put at the far right of the card, typically I think in columns 72 to 80, because these are 80 column cards. You could put a sequencing number here. You could have them automatically sequenced and numbered as you punch them out on the card punch. The thing you used to dread more than anything else was to take these out of the box in which you carefully stack them up and then accidentally drop them on the floor. There is no quicker way to discover what n factorial means when you start trying to put them back together in the right order, armed only with your knowledge of Algol programs and which order these things must have occurred in. So all sorts of subterfuges used to be used, but the best was to have them numbered, if possible, and then, if you could afford one of these things, there were actually card collating machines where if you put in a randomised deck of cards, they could electromechanically sort them for you. I can't recall I ever used one of those. Perhaps I was careful enough, or perhaps the university couldn't afford one. I don't know. Another common trick to use was to actually put marker pen markings at the top of these. If you did, or you wrote a word here, you could get them broadly back in the correct order by just making your patterns at the top look correct and you get them back in, in roughly the way they should have been. So here we have, you see, a much more substantial Algol job. I think most of this is programmed, there's a little bit of data at the bottom. And so would you have one of these cards for every line? Would that be kind of how it Every works? line of the programme, yeah, would have a card. So a line. And one you, line. You could only line. fit one line per card. That's yeah, yeah, one line per card. Right at the end of this wodge of stuff, Let's put it down here as a separate card of its own. You see that magic word end, and that is the final end of the program. And just as in other languages, your open and closed curly braces can be nested inside each other, so also in Algol, the begin end the blocks could be nested inside one another. So that end then is the final card of the program, but then look what happens. You get a four asterisks card. The four asterisks is a marker to say that's the end of my program, but there's still another section of my stuff to come. After four asterisks, you give the reserved word data. And this is such a simple program, I think from what I can make out, it takes these three integers here and uses them to generate yet more data, which will be of use in some other program. So that is it. There's the data, that's the end of the pack. If you had a program that generated more data for input to another program, a favourite thing you could do was to specify in your job control at the very top that what you would like is not just a line printer output of your answers, but to punch out another deck of cards for use in putting it into some other program later on. So that could, that could basically provide you with a set of data to use with a different program. Yes, and you might say, well, why not just park it in a disk file? You've got to remember, this is the early 70s. You did not have a personal allocation of files on disk. Yes, there would be a disk backing up this computer, but used entirely by the operating system, full of temporary files holding your jobs for you, feeding them in in order and all that. But in the very early days, you in person did not get a personal account to hold your files. You wanted to run something later on, then you had to print it out. So, whereas nowadays, a lot of you know, if you want to punch out data for use in another program, you can either use a Unix pipe and pipe it directly into another program, or you can use the Unix greater than symbol and send it into a file. Much more complicated in these days. You had to announce ahead of time that you'd be punching out results as well as printing them out. <laughs> now that's interesting. What would a computer do with a hanging chad? The omission of Richard Stallman's name was not intentional. I was thinking of him, actually, as I spoke. I was tempted for a while, and many of my friends told me to try this on with you, but maybe not. It would tend that the compressed air, uh, there's a lot of compressed air used in these machines, to move the cars through very quickly.